shot. It's the baby's buttocks. She's breech. Oh, my God. I thought she had two heads. <laughs> Let's have a little fun today and check out one of my favorite shows of all time, Friends. There's some medical scenes on there that are questionable, and I want to review them with you. Let's get started. Am I interrupting? Oh, no. Dr. Long, please come in. This is Ross. He is the father. But not the husband, because evidently she can do this alone. I really felt like I was Ross growing up. I, I was the geek, I was the nerd, and I've always loved Rachel. Here's your uterus, and right here is your baby. Oh my God. Always a really powerful moment when parents get to see the heartbeat of the baby. I would usually show the chambers and the heart beating. Family gets really excited. It's a special place to be when you're delivering a baby. Like as a family medicine doctor, I no longer do it, even though I'm licensed and I know how. I've delivered 38 babies in residency. Pretty amazing, huh? I've seen friends so many times. I know what she's crying about. I don't see it! <laughs> It's so funny, nowadays it would be less of an issue because we have like these 3D ultrasounds that can actually show the face of the baby. We can print out the pictures and then the parents go show them around to their families. It's really cute. Hi, hi this is Rachel Green. I'm Ross Geller. We, we called from the car. Right. We have a semi-private labor room waiting for you. Oh, so whoa, we're just whoa, gonna... whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm yeah. sorry. Semi-private? We, we, <laughs> we asked for a private room. Yeah. Yes, I see that here. Unfortunately, we can't guarantee a private room and currently they're all unavailable. Hospitals, especially in big cities like New York City, they run out of rooms quickly. So sometimes, especially when you first arrive, you can get only a semi-private room and then like whoever has the most seniority who's been in the hospital the longest, they may shift you around and move you to a private room. Check these out. Uh It's a funny position for us. Back in the day, these used to be called stirrups. We tend not to use that word anymore because weird connotations. We now call them leg rests or ankle rests or foot rests. What's that? New people. <laughs> When it's your first pregnancy, statistically it takes longer. You have a longer labor. If someone's coming in for their third or fourth baby, usually the process is a lot quicker, so you're gonna have multiple roommates if it's your first. You listen to me, since I have been waiting four women, that's four, one higher than the number of centimeters that I am dilated, have come and gone with their babies. I'm next. It's my turn. It's only fair. When she says she's uh, three centimeters dilated, what she's talking about is the opening of the cervix. That's the uh, opening of the uterus. The way we monitor the progression of labor is through doing an estimate measurement, uh, usually through a digital exam using our fingers, to see what that dilation is. And three centimeters dilated is really early in the labor process. Push. I'm gonna push for five more seconds. My favorite part of this is the resident or medical student just standing there. That is so accurate. <laughs> they just stand there aimlessly like, what should I do? I'm learning. That was me back in the day. That was all of us. One thing is, I don't know why the doctor's not wearing a mask. We wear masks. Wait, I see something. What, you do? You do? Oh my God! Don't say, oh my God, oh my God, what? What is that? It's the baby's buttocks. She's breech. Oh my God, I thought she had two heads. <laughs> <laughs> Breach means the baby is coming out not head first, coming out butt first, which is problematic. You want the baby to come down and descend the canal head first. Uh, Breach has a high rate of complications. It's gonna be a tricky delivery, especially if it's this far along, but I love that Ross took a look and did not faint. Because a lot of fathers, when they take a look, they're not ready to see everything that's going on. They get a vasovagal reaction where blood pressure drops, not enough circulation, not enough blood flow getting to the head, and they go wham! I always have my nurses keeping an eye on the dads while uh, the mom's delivering. You're gonna have to push even harder. Nothing's happening. I'm sorry, I can't. Yes, you can. Hey, hey, come on, you can. I know you can do this. Let's go. I can't. No, I can't. Please, you do it for me. No. <laughs> what they're missing here is the mom shouldn't just be pushing aimlessly. She should be doing it along with the contraction, so it should be timed. Like we get to see the baby monitor um, on the side. When we see the contraction starting, mom should feel it. And at that point, we should have the mom bear down, push, count, and maybe give a second effort there. But they're just, looks like they're pushing aimlessly. <laughs> that is not a newborn baby. <laughs> oh, she, she's perfect. Oh, wow. Oh, oh she's so tiny. <laughs> Where'd she go? 
So we always try and get the baby on the mom's chest as fast as possible. We feel like the best uh, sort of effects happen when the baby gets right on the mom's chest. Mom calms down, it helps lower her blood pressure, slow the heart rate down, baby feels mom. It's like nature at its finest. And while mom is holding the baby, then we let the father step in and cut the umbilical cord. Dads panic when they cut the umbilical cord because it's kind of rubbery and it takes a little bit of force and they don't want to hurt anything. So they're really worried about doing it. It's really cute to watch. And I love that. That's like one of my favorite parts, getting the dad involved to do something. Hi, and you're going into what grade? <laughs> uh, I'm actually a first year resident, but I get that a lot. See, I graduated early. Uh -huh, uh, me too. That's me every time in the hospital. What are you, 10? Are you in kindergarten? What grade are you in? Are you like uh, Doogie Hauser? Then occasionally someone would be like, wow, you're young, that means you must be smart. And I was like, thank you. Mr. Tribbiani, I'm afraid you've got kidney stones. Uh, well, what else could it be? It's kidney stones. <laughs> to diagnose kidney stones, sometimes we do uh, an x-ray like that. Better tests, which we tend to do more often, would be a CT scan with very specific parameters. We could also get an ultrasound. All those are options. Better, sweetie? Maybe a little. Wish you hadn't seen me throw up. Sometimes the pain can get so bad that it can lead you to vomit. I'm gonna give you a little revelation here. I've passed kidney stones before. When I was really young, didn't drink a lot of water, I drank a lot of soda, and I passed one of these stones, and they were tiny, 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 but boy, did it hurt. There was blood. Oh my God, if you ever have to pass one, I'm sorry, because it's not a fun experience. So I sympathize with my patients, and I empathize with my man Joey here. Now, ordinarily, Mr. Trebbiani, we try to break the stones up with shock waves, but they're too close to the bladder now, which means we can either wait for you to pass them or else go up the urethra. Oh. <laughs> no, 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 no. Nothing is going up, okay? Up. Up is not an option. What's a urethra? <laughs> Actually, up is sometimes an option, and sometimes it's something we have to do to inspect the bladder. Another potential option for patients who are looking to pass stones is giving them a medication to help in that process, to relax the smooth muscles of that area. Oh my God. You did it, man. <laughs> Would you like to see them? They're so small. They're not that small, those are fairly big size. I was in the shower and as I was cleansing myself, I, uh, I, I, well, I felt something. Was it like a sneeze, only better? <laughs> no, no, I mean, I mean like a thing on my body. Well, what was it? Well, I, I don't know, it's, it's kind of in a place that's not, it's not visually accessible to me, and I was hoping maybe you guys could, could help me out. Whoa! <laughs> It's funny because random people tend to approach me and show me their lesions quite often. I cannot imagine how dermatologists must feel. That's not a third nipple. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's on your ass. <laughs> Doctors don't say that. Jansen, will you come in here a moment? I'm with Hamilton. He's good with weird things. Bring him in too. <laughs> It's funny because anytime you have a rare condition in a hospital, you're gonna get residents, specialists, fellows, everyone coming in, not only to help the case, but also to learn because we learn from our patients as much as we help them. Uh, uh, uh. You okay, Ross? I don't know. Uh. <laughs> What's in this pie? Uh, I don't know, um, butter and eggs and flour and lime and kiwi. Ki and kiwi, kiwi? You said it was a key lime pie. No, I didn't. I said kiwi lime. That's what makes it so special. That's what's gonna kill me. <laughs> I'm allergic to kiwi. Russ is experiencing an anaphylactic attack. His upper airway is literally swelling. It's closing up. That can be quite dangerous quite quickly. He also has dilation of all of his blood vessels, which drops your blood pressure quite rapidly. Your heart rate usually springs up to compensate for this loss of pressure, but sometimes the blood pressure effects can lead you to faint, vomit, feel awful, have a headache, and you desperately need to get to a place that has an epinephrine auto injector. No, you're not. You're, you're allergic to lobster and peanuts and. Uh. <laughs> this reminds me of the scene from Hitch. Whoa, whoa. Are you right? Oh, no, yeah. Is your tongue swelling up? Either that or my mouth is getting smaller. Both? All right, get your coat. We're gonna go to the hospital. You really should call 911 in these situations because. 
the ambulance will arrive usually with an epinephrine auto injector on board and they can administer it if they need to. The last thing you want is to get in a car and then the swelling gets worse and then your throat closes up in the car and you don't know what to do. So call 911 for help, even if you actually give yourself an epinephrine auto injector, you should still head to the ER. 20% of the time, you may need either a second injection or other interventions because the first one has failed. You also need to be monitored after you give yourself epinephrine, your heart rate, your blood pressure, all of that. There's no way I'm gonna get a shot. I mean, maybe they can take the needle, you know, and squirt it into my mouth, You're like, like a squirt gun. You have to give the shot, you have to give it quickly, way quicker than what he's experiencing here, and you have to give it right in the anterior lateral portion of your thigh. That's where you can get the most absorption as fast as possible. Remember, this is an emergency. You add a pinch of saffron, it makes all the difference. This is partially the reason I really wanted to be a doctor. This scene, the admiration Monica and Rachel are giving my man George, and I forgot the other, John White? Will? Noah Wiley getting all this attention, I wanted it. Mostly because no one paid attention to me, not because I was like huge ego. You're gonna walk over to the operating table, you're gonna stop on that blue mark, you're gonna put the tray down. Don't walk too fast, but don't dawdle. <laughs> okay, now what? If they're truly operating on this patient, why are all their masks down, and why does Phoebe have no gloves on? I don't like what's happening here. I know this is a show inside of a show inside of a show, and we're in Inception land, but I still get frustrated because I want you to have an accurate picture of what happens in a hospital system, you dig? Don't know what I'm doing, but it feels like I'm squaring up the conversation. How's it going? It's going really good. But enough about me, come on. <laughs> what, what, where are you from? What do you do? I'm a doctor. Right. Right, I'm actually, I meant, you know, in your spare time. Do you cook, do you ski, or just hang out with your wife or girlfriend? Uh, I don't have a wife or a girlfriend, but I, I do like to ski. Oh, I love to ski. How amazing is this? This conversation legitimately happens. It happens more, actually, in the hospital setting. Patients are usually there overnight or for several days at a time. You get quite lonely, so they want to have a conversation. But when it starts crossing into that territory where they're trying to get into my personal life and see if I'm single, that's when it gets a little weird and boundaries need to be set. So are you experiencing any discomfort? No, I'm very comfortable. Oh my God, this reminds me of my interview that I just did on The Daily Show not too long ago. How close is too close? Ideally, you'd want to keep six feet away from anyone uh, that you're not familiar with. Would this be too close? In my medical, professional medical opinion, I would say that's too close. So six feet and the washing your hands. Is this too close? That would be too close. Too Awkward. Here's two throwback medical drama reviews. ER, Doogie, Hauser. Which one are you gonna watch? Watch them both. Medical accuracy is not bad in both, but which one are you watching? As always, stay happy and healthy.